I'm uh, in the field of urban planning and have been researching planning for sustainable development and planning for sustainable lifestyles for many years. Um, and the last um, few years I've been focusing on consumption and consumption of goods. Uh, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so internationally, uh, this is how is how Sweden has been marketing itself in terms of uh, the uh, environmental and societal success story. Uh, this is a, a project and platform called Symbiocity Sustainability by Sweden, which was a, a private public partnership um, where uh, Sweden has uh, been selling uh, and, and, and using this platform to export clean tech products and services, uh, primarily to China, but also to many other countries. Um, and this image has been used in Symbiocity to portray the success story that Sweden has experienced. So increasing GDP growth uh, and at the same time decreasing uh, CO2 emissions. So the decoupling of uh, growth and environmental impact. And of course, this is very, this is what so many countries want to achieve. So whatever we have done to do this, and whatever pro products and services we have used, you know, there is uh, an interest to buying these services. Um, but at the same time, uh, this story, and this is in a sense is still the official story of, of, of Sweden, uh, it only takes into account certain parts of our consumption. And if you look at uh, this kind of data, which is from the Environmental Protection Agency uh, in Sweden, uh, you can see that when we say we have decoupled, uh, we only count the emissions that are within the boundaries, the administrative boundaries of Sweden. So the um, effects of our consumption in other countries, uh, the emissions from the refrigerators we buy, from the uh, air travel we make, etc., it doesn't count. Um, so what has happened is that it's true then that the emissions in Sweden, they have decreased. That's the yellow part of this graph. Uh, whereas the emissions in other countries outside of Sweden, due to Swedish consumption, has been going up a slight a downturn during the economic crisis, but in the general trend is increasing. So I think that is important to bear with us. Uh, and also, if we are to take on the sustainability sort of challenge seriously, we need to also consider the consumption and consumption of goods and consumption of services that uh, is affecting other countries. Um, and um, uh, in terms of, of consumption, this is a kind of a, 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 a joke or a, a serious joke, you could say, based on, on Maslow's um, ladder of needs, uh, that it's not only about buying. I mean, in the general mainstream discussion on sustainable consumption, it's very been much focused on buying, educating consumers to buy the right products, sustainable eco labeled products. So uh, sort of improve the buying this uh, here uh, at the top, uh, but not so much about uh, making yourself uh, thrift to buy second hand, uh, swap, borrow or use what you have. Maybe you don't need to buy new things. And this is kind of basic uh, knowledge. I mean, a child would understand this, that it's more resource efficient to use what you have rather than, than buy something new or to uh, buy second hand. But in, in general, sort of politics and, and planning, it's the focus has been on shifting products to more, more sustainable products. This is, of course, important, but it's not enough. Uh, and, and in terms of the... Um, uh, the the policy the EU policies on uh, waste, for instance, it's taken more or less. It's it's explicit that we need to also minimize waste. It's not just enough to to change the the products, but we actually need to consume less also. Uh, so um, what I've been exploring in my uh, uh, research is I've been interested in looking at so what are what kind of movements are there. 
that are trying to envision another sort of uh, way of living, which is not the sort of um, mass consumerist society, uh, basically. Uh, what about other sort of identities, social uh, uh, groups and, and uh, uh, ways of life that, um, that sort of build on other ideas of, of consumption and production? And in this um, explorations, empirical work, I've been uh, researching the maker culture um, and uh, sort of the DIY um, culture of, of doing things yourself and doing together, remaking stuff, repairing and sort of innovating. Um, and often in, 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 I mean, the maker culture is really diverse, uh, but part of it is, uh, I would say, or, or, or quite a large part of it is also about doing things because there is a genuine interest in doing it and because you believe in uh, whatever the, the product or, uh, uh, or thing you're making rather than just for sort of commercial in order to sell or to make a profit. So um, as you see in this image, um, uh, which is part of a uh, from a maker space weapons of mass creation rather than, than destruction knitting uh, sewing machine uh, etc and uh, this is something that we've seen all over the the world actually this kind of interest for the the maker and DIY culture uh, which I think mirrors some kind of of, of uh, fatigue of consumerist culture um, and um, the, uh, in, in certain countries, uh, like in Barcelona, where I've been doing empirical work, the city is also very active in terms of uh, funding and supporting some maker spaces of fab labs, fabrication laboratories, and seeing them as kind of the new citizen uh, hub or citizen house, a kind of an extension of the, of the traditional library or citizen uh, meeting uh, space. So where you gather not only to get um, sort of books or, or sort of uh, the uh, traditional forms of knowledge, but also where you get practical skills and, and knowledge. And, and uh, the vision for Barcelona has been to become the fab city, in a sense, uh, where these kind of repair studios and maker spaces should be one in each district. Uh, which I think is, is interesting. They're not there yet, but this is what they're working on. Uh, so uh, this is uh, um, a statement uh, from uh, sustainability researchers Julian Ageman and his colleagues uh, arguing that building a sharing infrastructure and culture is quite simply one of the most important things cities can do to contribute to a fair and sustainable world. Um, so this sharing infrastructure, uh, I've been interested in, what is that? Uh, what kind of infrastructure uh, could facilitate sharing, making and, and repairing? And how could cities and local governments, municipalities work with this? Uh, so this is something that I've been exploring and what also what it means for the role of the citizens. And uh, more specifically, um, I've been doing uh, recently a case study in the city of Malmö uh, and I've chosen that city because it's one of the cities in Sweden that have consciously been working with the uh, sharing infrastructure. And, and this is a, a quote from, the, from their environmental program, their uh, politically adopted program where it says that uh, the city should work with access to products, skills and services as car sharing, bike sharing, tool pools, clothing libraries, repair studios and other fora for swapping, renting, reusing, etc. shall be scaled up and developed. So this is a formal goal uh, that the city of Malmö has which I think is interesting because that's not necessarily in the standard environmental sort of programs or city plans, uh, uh, at least not in, in Sweden. Uh, so what does this mean and what can it look like? Uh, one example from uh, Malmö of this sharing infrastructure is a place called Stapeln, uh, uh, which is a multi-purpose sort of maker space, you could say. Uh, it contains several different types of, of subspaces, uh, one of them being this uh, 
bike kitchen, cykelköket, which you can see here. Um, so this is an open DIY repair workshop for bikes uh, to which anyone can come and uh, use or borrow the tools that are there to fix their bikes. Um, and they can also access spare parts, so whatever uh, uh, frames or uh, um, uh, wheels, uh, etc., from old bikes that have been abandoned uh, in the city. So the, this um, space, they collaborate with housing associations and the police, which gathers unused or bikes that have been abandoned. So they give these old bikes and they demount them and you can access spare parts for free. So it's kind of a, an example of a circular resource flow sort of in, in practice. So you can come there with your own bike, but you can also come there uh, as a newly arrived person, whatever, to Malmö without the bike and uh, access uh, uh, a kind of a broken bike and, and fix it or assemble your own actually from lots of different parts. And, and it's not only about reusing stuff and sharing of tools, but it's also very much about sharing and collaborative um, making. So you help each other. Uh, basically, there are some volunteers at the space that can show you some basics, but otherwise the idea is you help each other and you can learn from each other. Once you've fixed a flat tire, it's really easy to show somebody next to you how to do it. And when I've been spending time in, in this stop, and I think it's one of the, I think, best examples of where people from different um, societal whatever backgrounds and socioeconomic groups really meet and interact, actually talk and, and do things together, uh, not just see each other on a, you know, a big public square or so, but, but actually have interaction. Um, because it, it, people from all over uh, Malmö uh, come here. And it's not only those super nerdy people interested in bikes, but also old ladies and, and so on. And they also have a makerspace where you can um, use 3D printers and, and, and so on. And take a textile workshop where you can use sewing machines and um, weaving machines, etc. And the collaboration with uh, uh, an industry making um, uh, stockings. Uh, so the leftover material from that industry goes to Stoppen where kids can come and remake and, um, uh, things into whatever new uh, toys and so on. Um, and this, what I think is interesting here is that this is something that was initiated by the city of Malmö. So they saw that there is a need for, for some kind of, uh, kind of a hub for um, repair and recreating and sort of making things. It's not a space where you're a passive sort of consumer of culture. You'll look at theater plays or something, but you're actually doing things yourself. Um, and, and then it's run by an N NGO uh, that is independent from the municipality, but it's an active uh, sort of um, strategy from the municipality to initiate these kind of spaces and fund them. They also get other types of funding, but they have basic funding, funding for the premises from the city. Uh, and um, another uh, example from Malmö also is a place called Garaget. Uh, which is an urban living room. Um, and this is in an old uh, space where the um, uh, uh, trains used to uh, be overnight, basically. Um, so it's really a high ceiling and a, a, a big, fantastic space in many ways. Uh, and this is run by the municipality. Um, and it's they also talk about it as an urban living room. So it should be a space where anybody feel welcome to come and uh, yeah, kind of relax or, or do things uh, like you can come there, repair your pants. Uh, you can, uh, there's also sewing machines, materials, you can uh, create new stuff, but you can also uh, remake um, and access sort of simple tools. There are certain things you need to, pa to pay like, uh, uh, you know, the basic cost for it. But otherwise, uh, the space and the tools is free of use for everyone. And you can also use your library, your public library card here to both, I mean, there are books and magazines and, and things like that, which is uh, the usual thing at libraries, but you can also borrow tools. You can borrow um, 
whatever different DIY tools that you might need in your home or your garden. Uh, but you can also <laughs> borrow as an example this uh, Garaget's, uh, the, the democracy kit uh, <laughs> of Garaget. So, which is a uh, heft pistol, <laughs> I don't know how to translate that. When you're, spo you're doing posters uh, out in the city to put them up. Uh, megaphone, uh, scene, uh, uh, creative workshop, meeting rooms, tables, coffee machines, wireless networks, projector, laptop, uh, smart board, uh, etc. Whatever the speaker, things you would need to organize an event or to um, stage uh, uh, some kind of manifestation or so, being facilitating for people to be politically active, basically. Uh, and this you use your library card for. Um, you can also borrow the whole space. So if you'd like to make some kind of event, like a film screening evening, a concert or something, you can use the space for free. Actually, you get the keys to it and you can use it as long as you keep it open for everyone to, to come. Not, so not for like private parties. Uh, so um, I think this is, this is interesting because it's, it takes the whatever citizen uh, house or, or library to another, uh, expands the, this notion of it. Um, and so, um, the conclusions here. So what do I want to, to say with this? Um, that, um, I, uh, as I mentioned in, in the beginning also, these kind of examples of by kitchens, maker spaces, fab labs, DIY repair workshops, sometimes called repair cafes also, that they could be seen as the future sort of community center or public library. Sometimes they're run by the by the municipality and sometimes not, sometimes they're independent. Uh, but the general, I would say, common denominator is that it is open for everyone, at least parts of the time. It might have certain times uh, workshops only for members or so, but it should, a makerspace, for instance, or a fab lab should be open uh, for everyone, certain hours. Um, and also that these spaces build on sort of ideas about collaboration, that you're not just a passive receiver of something, but you come there in a, a, at a makerspace, for instance, and also give something. So maybe not you don't give money, but you give your skills or your whatever uh, you may, might uh, organize or host a, a workshop, for instance, or help others. Um, so it's about also creating other types of economies, non-monetary economies. Um, and I think this is really important for, for many people to not only be part of the monetary economy, but also to build other types of, of social and solidarity economies with, with others. And uh, the, what we did in Malmö is that we interviewed public officials um, at at the city and also people working and using these spaces. And uh, the public officials saw sh this sharing infrastructure as it's not only an environmental whatever policy thing. They saw it as combining multiple goals uh, of the municipality. So it's a, what it's both about. They could use kind of resources from the social uh, budget in a sense. Um, so it could be about social justice and empowerment, uh, but also about resource efficiency. So they could sort of gather and pool resources from different kind of funds and projects. Um, and also um, aims of social integration. A as I mentioned, these two spaces uh, really managed to get people from lots of different places in the city to, to meet and interact. And um, here, I would say also, the citizens are seen not only as sort of producers uh, working and then consuming, but they're seen as active, as sharers and makers, which um, are skills that are important, particularly in the future that might be marked by resource scarcity and, and sort of economic uncertainty. It's, it's important skills to have also to be able to to collaborate uh, with others and uh, be part of these kind of um, networks where you can, where you can make repair on your own, not only being reliant on having to buy these kind of services. So that was basically my short uh, um, analysis and, and conclusions drawn from these uh, case studies.
Thank you for listening.